Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Hello. Hi. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to get started because um, I want to um, make a few announcements before we get started with Grand Rounds. And I, I want to make sure we have the maximum time with our speaker today. I want to welcome you all on behalf of Chris Palmer and myself to our new academic year and a new Grand Rounds series. I hope you've all had great summers. It's wonderful to see everybody back. And um, I did want to just call your attention um, to the fact that we have a number of visiting scholars coming this fall. We have, I think, a great Grand Round series coming for the whole year. But in particular, this fall, in addition to our visiting scholar today, we also have on September 13th Dr. Mark Schechter, who's going to be talking about psychotherapy with suicidal patients, an integrative approach. Uh, our Dean of Harvard Medical School, Dean George Daly, he is coming to give Grand Rounds here on October 4th, so I hope you'll mark your calendar for that. We're also having the first inaugural Kathy Cook Lecture in Women's Mental Health um, entitled Birth Outcomes Among Pregnant Women with Mood and Anxiety Disorders, and that um, will bring to us a visiting scholar, Dr. Kimberly Yonkers. So that's on October 11th, and I hope you'll mark your calendars. And also, a little bit later in the fall, on November 15th, we're delighted that Dr. Linda Carpenter will be here with us to talk about brain stimulation and TMS. So I just want to, I know you've all received a memo, and it's all on brainwaves, and you can look, but the, I just think those are a couple of dates I, I would like you to please mark. So, as you know, in September, um, we are, um, have a tradition now of celebrating Women in Medicine and Science Month, and uh, we have a couple of special events. Um, this is one of them, uh, where we are uh, wel welcoming Dr. Maria Akendo. Um, I just want to make sure you're all aware that following Grand Rounds at 115, Dr. Kendo is going to be also giving a career talk, leading and loving it. And you're welcome to attend. A number of you have RSVP'd already, but um, if you want to stay, we're going to start as promptly as we possibly can at 115. And also in honor of Women in Medicine and Science Month, we are really incredibly unfortunate. We are incredibly fortunate next week that our neuroscience seminar series, which some of you attend, which is at 11 um, on Tuesday morning, we will welcome Dr. Meg Haney, who is a professor of neuropsychiatry, neurobiology, I'm sorry, and psychiatry at Columbia. And she's also the president of the College of Problems on Drug Dependence. And it would be wonderful to have her here. She'll be giving a neuroscience seminar at 11, and it's also followed by a career talk at noon. And I really invite all of you to, um, to please attend. So with that, I really am just extremely thrilled and delighted to have the opportunity to welcome Dr. Maria Kendo, um, a colleague. Um, she and I had great pleasure of spending yesterday um, in D.C. at a meeting in an area of mutual interest um, uh, about uh, the epidemic of uh, opioid use disorder and its convergence with, the, um, with suicide and to think about how um, the field might go forward in considering what to do um, with that population. So Dr. Kendo is the Ruth Meltzer Professor and Chairman of Psychiatry at the University of Pennsylvania. She graduated summa cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa from Tufts University and received her MD from the College of Physicians and Surgeons at Columbia University. She completed her residency training at Payne Whitney Clinic of New York Hospital Cornell and received her PhD in psychiatry from the Universidad Autonoma de Madrid. She is a member of the National Academy of Medicine, which, as you know, is one of the highest honors in medicine. Dr. Kendo uses multimodal imaging to map brain abnormalities in mood disorders and suicidal behavior. Her expertise ranges from psychopharmacology to global mental health, with over 385 peer-reviewed publications. In 2003, when issues regarding antidepressants, potential risk for inducing suicidal behavior first arose, Dr. Kendo and her colleagues were commissioned by the FDA to develop a classification system to examine suicide-related events in the data. This system is endorsed by the FDA and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and is now used worldwide. Dr. Kendo first proposed suicidal behavior should be its own diagnostic category in 2008, arguing that it would facilitate the tracking of high-risk patients in medical records and succeeding in adding it to the DSM-5's appendix in 
2013. Dr. Okendo is also the past president of the American Psychiatric Association and the International Academy of Suicide Research. She chairs the American Foundation for Society for Suicide Prevention Scientific Board of Directors. She is also the president-elect of the American College of Neuropsychopharmacology. And with that, I really want to um, ask you to warmly welcome Dr. Okendo. Thank you, Shelley, for that very lovely introduction. Can everybody hear me? Terrific. So I'm going to talk today about suicidal behavior, and I'm going to start with some general descriptions of suicidal behavior and suicidal ideation that I hope will create some context for the models that we're developing to try to understand how different types of manifestations of suicidal thoughts and behavior might comport with different systems in the brain that have been demonstrated to be critical in suicidal behavior. And th that data comes from both post-mortem studies and uh, live patient studies. And um, I look forward to having a conversation with you about it afterwards. So these are my disclosures. So let, let me just start by talking about um, what, what we mean by suicidal behavior. And I'll start with suicidal ideation because many times, clinically, people think about suicidal ideation as being a binary variable. It's either present or it's absent. But in fact, it has many, many dimensions. So if you can imagine the individual who you talk to and who tells you that sometimes they wish they just wouldn't w wake up, ranging to the individual who is tormented by intrusive thoughts about wanting to kill themselves, who can't get away from those thoughts, it immediately becomes apparent that there's a tremendous range of variability in that type of thinking. The other thing that's critical about suicidal ideation is that for some individuals it's quite persistent and it happens over periods of days, weeks, months, and more. And for other individuals, it happens in the context of a stressor. Something bad happens to the person, and boom, they develop suicidal ideation. So I think that as we think clinically in, in working with our patients, obviously the different types of suicidal ideation that people manifest may relate to different risk profiles. Traditionally in psychiatry, we've thought about suicidal ideation as being a harbinger of risk for suicidal behavior, particularly if the suicidal ideation also includes an intent to act on those thoughts, right? So we often spend a lot of time assessing our patients to see, okay, so you're thinking about suicide, you've identified a method, how likely are you to do it? How well do you think you could resist these ideas or these urges? As we talk later today, I hope to illustrate why that has some face validity, but may not be precise enough to identify all the, the individuals at risk. Suicide attempts, on the other hand, are of course when people actually act on their suicidal thoughts. And one of the things that's been fascinating to observe, as you know, about half of the individuals who die by suicide have never made a suicide attempt. But we do know that for every suicide attempt that a person makes, they have an increase of 50% in their chance of make, making another suicide attempt. And we also know that individuals who make suicide attempts are at greater risk for suicide death. Interestingly, we recently, in uh, 2003, as Shelley was uh, mentioning, I guess it's not recent anymore. I think it's recent. But uh, we, we, we have identified some other types of suicidal behavior. Before, we used to think about suicide attempt as being, OK, the person has to actually take some action that initiates the behavior. So it's not simply that the person goes to the bathroom and looks at the pills in the medicine cabinet and thinks about it, and then goes and writes a note. That's not enough. They have to actually at least pour the pills into their hand. 
But as we started looking at the FDA data, it occurred to us that people engage in all sorts of other suicide-like behaviors that may also confer risk. So for example, we developed a uh, designation of interrupted suicide attempt, a situation in which, for example, an individual has a loaded gun, is about to shoot themselves, and somebody interrupts them and takes the gun away. Now, I would argue, as we did, that that individual is at very high risk, even though nothing bad happened. Similarly, there are some individuals who will start to take action. So they may actually go and uh, walk over to the bridge to jump. And then, upon further thought, decide not to act on it. We call that an aborted attempt. Interestingly, our data now strongly suggests that these two types of behavior that previously went uncategorized, at least in, in, the, data's, in the data that most, most uh, researchers who work with suicide, that those types of behaviors, which are captured in the uh, uh, Columbia uh, Suicide Severity Rating Scale, which, uh, as you saw, I, I receive uh, royalties for, that that type of behavior is also predictive of future suicide attempts. And so as we understand more about the phenotypes that are relevant for predicting risk, it helps us better understand who the patients are who we should be monitoring more carefully. Non-suicidal self-injury is a completely different animal. And if you talk to patients in the emergency room or if you take care of patients who are adolescents or patients with borderline personality disorder, you've seen these kinds of patients, right? And they will tell you that their self-injury has nothing to do with wanting to die. They are trying to remedy an extremely distressing emotional state that they describe oftentimes as being severe anxiety, they describe as being dissociation, which of course is related to severe anxiety, or some other kind of distressing internal state. And that somehow, paradoxically, in a way that if you're not in that individual situation, is kind of hard to fathom, that somehow, by cutting themselves, for example, that act itself somehow relieves their anxiety. Somehow the idea that there is something physically painful maybe draws the gap between the subjective state and the physical state a little bit closer and reduces their anxiety. And it's important to keep that in mind because, of course, from a clinical standpoint, you're going to make very different decisions about the person who self-injures and the person who makes suicide attempts. That said, we do know that while many people who self-injure, especially as young adolescents, right, a lot of kids do things like headbanging, not a lot, but a good 15 to 20 percent of adolescents will uh, acknowledge that they engage in things like burning themselves, picking out their skin, scratching themselves, cutting themselves. Many of those individuals will never go on to make a suicide attempt. But there is an important sub subset of these individuals who do have suicidal behavior, and we're in the process of analyzing some data to try to see if we can identify who those individuals are and what the common characteristics are. And finally, of course, suicide is when the individual actually dies by their own hand. And I don't have to tell this crowd that, uh, unfortunately, we are in the middle of a huge suicide epidemic. The uh, latest numbers available are from 2016 and suggest that about 44,000 people in this country died by suicide. 14 per 100,000 is the actual number now, and it's been going up relentlessly since 1999. And you may hear people say, well, it's the same as it was a century ago. And while that's true, if the rates of death from TB were the same as a century ago, we would not feel very calm about that. So I think it's really relevant to keep our eye on the ball and the fact that over the last 30 years there has been uh, an increase uh, from a nadir back in the 90s in uh, suicidal behavior. So the epidemiology of suicidal behavior is quite varied, and sex has a lot to do with it. So we know, for example, that for every two men who report suicidal ideation, three women report suicidal ideation. In suicide attempts also, the ratio of males to females 
is similar. So for every one male who makes a suicide attempt, four females will make a suicide attempt. But interestingly, in suicide death, the ratio is reversed. And so for every three males that, make, that die by suicide, there's one female that dies by suicide. And those types of ratios are fairly consistent across Western uh, countries. Suicidal behavior and suicide death varies tremendously across the world. And one of the things that's been very interesting as someone who loves maps and, and these heat maps in particular, um, if you had pulled up, this is a, a map from the World Health Organization. If you had pulled up this map from the World Health Organization about 10 years ago, most of sub-Saharan Africa would not have any estimates. Now, this is not to say that in sub-Saharan Africa they're actually counting the deaths. Uh, for those of you who do global work, you know that the uh, methods for uh, accounting for causes of mortality are, are very much in need of development. These are estimates that are, that are derived um, by uh, economists. But still, at least now we have some estimates that can begin to put some, um, some context into what's happening across the world. One of the things that I think is also interesting is that while there is a lot of consternation in South America about uh, suicidal behavior, uh, the bulk of the countries really have suicide rates that are closer to five per 100,000, so almost a third of what it is in the United States. And the reasons for that are not well known, but it's interesting that uh, Uruguay and Bolivia do have very high suicide rates and their populations are not necessarily significantly different culturally or ethnically that, that, as so much. Uh, so for example, Bolivia's population is very similar to southern Peru's population in terms of the mix of uh, blacks, whites, and indigenous populations, and, and culturally as well, since especially for uh, native uh, uh, tribes, they really don't respect the geographical boundaries that we have ar arbitrarily set uh, at this point. One of the things that I did want to mention is that while China has a very, um, I'd say, lower rate certainly than the US, seems modest, in China also the suicide rates are going up. And one of the things that's very interesting about China is that contrary to what we see in Western countries where about 90% of all individuals who die by suicide have a psychiatric disorder, some of the estimates in China are that between 50 and 60 percent of individuals who die by suicide appear not to have a psychiatric disorder. Now there, we can get into a whole discussion about what might be some of the methodological issues that uh, lead to that, but there probably is some truth to the fact that there are fewer people with psychiatric disorders. It, it's unlikely that, it's, that it would go, even if you accounted for all the methodological problems, from 60 to 10 percent. So we've thought about suicidal behavior as a stress diathesis type of situation. And in a way, we know that, uh, as I mentioned, at least in Western countries, certainly in the United States, psychological autopsy studies clearly show that 90% of individuals who die by suicide have a psychiatric disorder. That doesn't mean that they're treated, right? Because if you look at the CDC, you'll see that it says 50% of people have a psychiatric condition. It's like, that's a documented psychiatric condition. But if you use a psychological autopsy methodology where you actually go and you look at medical records and you talk to the treating physician, you talk to the family and the neighbors, 90% of the time, you can find evidence, even without the benefit of being able to talk to the individual, you can find evidence that that person suffered from a psychiatric condition. And still, that still leaves 10% of people where we don't really know whether they had a psychiatric condition or not. Maybe they didn't. And especially in situations where you have high-functioning individuals, and I suffered through this... Um, at Columbia New York Presbyterian four years ago when two of our interns died by suicide in internal medicine. And one of those individuals was described as one of the most upbeat, highly functional people. And so understanding how someone in that kind of situation 
can end up taking <coughs> their own life is, I think, something that we still need a lot of work to be able to decipher. Interestingly, okay, so the majority have a psychiatric condition. In fact, 70% of them have a major affective disorder. But even if you look at major affective illnesses, the vast majority of people don't die by suicide. Even in bipolar disorder, which, of course, um, you have experts here who have been studying suicide and bipolar disorder for a long time. But um, even in bipolar disorder, the vast majority of people don't kill themselves. So something else is going on. It's not simply the presence of a psychiatric condition. Something else is making that individual vulnerable to suicidal behavior. So in the stress diathesis model, what we propose is that the individual can go from a state in which they have no suicidal ideation, they're percolating along, they have this diathesis or vulnerability and the vulnerability has to do with things like the presence of aggressive behavior, childhood maltreatment, substance abuse. Perhaps they have low serotonergic tone, which we've uh, shown in many of our studies. And in that context, something happens, and they develop suicidal ideation. They develop a plan, and then they act on it. And one of the useful things about this model is that it helps explain why not everybody who has a major affective disorder dies by suicide or, or even makes a suicide attempt or even thinks about suicide. But it also helps us identify two different ways of preventing suicidal behavior, right? So for some individuals, the trigger is a life event. Well, we're not very good at preventing those types of things, but a trigger can also be a psychotic episode or an affective episode, and we're much better at preventing those things. In addition, there may be ways in which we can address the diathesis of the uh, individual by treating their substance abuse, by addressing their serotonergic tone that might also help pr protect people. And of course, there are also interventions that have to do with environmental risks, like for example, removing lethal means uh, from the house and the environment that can be very useful. So we set off to um, test this hypothesis, this stress diathesis hypothesis, with a series of studies that started in 1999. And um, what we did is we collected participants who volunteered uh, to participate in our study and did very extensive clinical and biological studies to try to understand exactly what the phenotype that we were confronting was, not only in terms of the clinical characteristics, but also in terms of biological characteristics. And what we do is we would uh, enroll them into the study, we do um, extensive evaluations, and then we would follow them in the community. So they'd receive naturalistic treatment, and we, we would assess them at three months, 12 months, and 24 months. And the idea was that we wanted to try to see if we could identify who are the people, what are the characteristics of the people who are going to go on to make a suicide attempt in the next two years? What do they look like when they come in so that the clinician who is making an evaluation, conducting an evaluation in the emergency department or in the outpatient clinic or what have you, has some data to be able to make an assessment about who's at high risk? And in doing these uh, analyses, what we found was that you could look at the data in, in, a, in a variety of ways. One, first, I should tell you that about 14% of the sample had suicidal behavior, including four individuals who died by suicide. And what you could see here is that there are dramatic increases in suicidal behavior immediately after entering the study, and not all of these patients were inpatients at the time of study, but, but many of them were. And that what, what you see is a leveling off of the curve, if you will, with the uh, passage of time. And what we found is that in green, if the person had a previous suicide attempt, they were at higher risk for future suicidal behavior. If they also had a high depression score, that increased their risk even further. And if they had a previous attempt, a high depression score, and were cigarette smokers, that very significantly increased their risk. Another way in which we looked at this data was to try to look at those 
diathesis components that we, met, that we mentioned. There's some chairs up here if you'd like to come up to the front and sit. So the diathesis measures uh, that we looked at were aggression and impulsivity and pessimism. And what we found is that for those individuals who had low aggression impulsivity and low pessimism, they were relatively protected, the curve in green. If they had either high pessimism or high aggression and impulsivity, their, in, their risk was somewhat increased. And if both of those characteristics of their diathesis were elevated, then they were at much greater risk for suicidal behavior in the uh, ongoing two years. Interestingly, these were composites of different rating scales that we used. And when we broke out the, com the, the components, the, the, these were generated using uh, principal components analysis. When we broke out the components, you could see this really lovely stepwise increase in risk with higher scores on each of the, uh, of the uh, scales that were used to generate the components. So if they had high aggression or if they had um, high impulsivity or high hostility or a combination of those, you would see a stepwise increment in the risk. And the same for the pessimism factor where we looked at not only depression scale, uh, scores but also hopelessness, reasons for living, and suicidal ideas. So that was all fine and good, but that didn't really test the, the hypothesis, right? Which was that you need both a diathesis, but you also need a precipitant. And so we collected more patients, and in this study we had uh, over 400 patients that we also followed for 3, 12, and 24 months. Same type of design, naturalistic treatment in the community. But what we did is that we would evaluate the patients and break the information down into month, monthly intervals and categorize those monthly intervals in terms of whether a depression was present or whether a life event was present. The idea was that we, we hypothesized that if the person had either a depressive episode or a life event, that they would be at greater risk for suicidal behavior during that particular month or maybe the month after. So we looked at this data and much to, let me just describe the sample a little bit because it's, it's relevant. Um, one of the things that was uh, very remarkable is the high percentage of individuals who reported childhood abuse. So almost 60% of the patients who were enrolled in the study reported that they had been abused as children. The other thing is that almost a third of the sample had borderline personality disorder. It's interesting because a lot of studies in, in mood disorders don't necessarily tease out the access to diagnoses, but because we're interested in suicide and borderline personality disorder is so commonly associated with suicidal behavior, we are very, very interested in this particular uh, issue. And for those of you who are interested in aggression, if the, you know that uh, a score of 18 on the Brown Goodwin is pretty high and also that the hostility and impulsivity uh, scores are you know, fairly uh, pronounced. So we, fo we followed these patients, and what we found is that for depression, there was almost a five-fold risk for suicidal behavior during the month in which the person was suffering from a depressive episode. But we could find no effect whatsoever for life events. And even if you had a life event on top of a major depressive episode, we couldn't see an effect, which didn't make any sense to us. So obviously, like most people who do research, we believe our hypotheses, and so we thought something was wrong with the data. And trust me, we looked at this six ways to Sunday. And finally, after, I think that we worked on the data for two years before we felt confident that, look, we were wrong. Stressors have nothing to do with it. And so I was thinking a lot about what could this possibly mean? How do we interpret this? So one thing that, that occurred to me is imagine that your patient has made a suicide attempt for no reason that's external, no precipitant. How does a patient manage the cognitive dissonance of taking an action like that? You can imagine, think about your own life. 
I don't know about you, but if I look at the last couple of months, I can report several very significant stressors. And I'm sure if you think about it, you could too. So I thought maybe what's happening is that in the case of the suicide attempt or the individual, or in the case of a suicide death, the family goes retrospectively and assigns causality to something that happened that was completely unrelated. So we sent it in for review. And you know, we often talk about, talk about the failures of uh, peer review. And I'm about to tell you about a success of peer review. So we send it to the reviewers, and of course, they don't believe it either. And one of the reviewers was very helpful and said, you know, you have a lot of patients with borderline personality disorder. You should separate those people out. Maybe it's different in patients with borderline personality disorder compared to patients without borderline personality disorder. So we did that, and it was absolutely striking. Once we looked at the data that way, what we found is that for the patients without borderline personality disorder, the effect of depression was still whopping, and I'll show you the data in a minute. Life events had a little effect. It was pretty unimpressive. But for the borderline patients, we couldn't find an effect of life events. And I'll tell you a little bit about some of our hypotheses about what that might be. But one of the things that we saw, and this won't surprise you, is that the patients with borderline personality disorder more frequently engaged in suicidal behavior during the follow-up. They also reported many more life events. That won't surprise you. Not many more, but they de de define more. And they also reported more, um, significantly more uh, personal and uh, psychosocial events, uh, as well as um, health events. So these two samples were different in those regards. And looking at the details, for the depressed patients with no borderline personality disorder, the months in which they were depressed, they had a 13-fold increased risk for suicidal behavior. In contrast, the occurrence of life events only increased by 33%. Pretty minor. And in the borderline patients, you saw an effect of depression, but not that strong, only threefold. And that life events seem, if anything, protective. So those of you who work with patients with borderline personality disorder may have observed that sometimes these patients, in the, in the context of a very serious external stressor, actually somehow pull it together. And we wondered whether that was at work here. The other thing that you know if you work with patients with borderline personality disorder is that oftentimes they become suicidal in the context of things that may not be salient to people without that type of disorder. So in the words of one of my own patients who said to me, doctor, it's like walking around without any skin. Things that other people don't notice affect them deeply. And so perhaps it's that the measures that we were using were just too blunt an instrument to really pick it up. And we're now using other types of um, methods like ecological momentary assessment to see if we can pick up more granular data on the effects of stressors on these types of individuals. So the fact that the life events didn't seem to further increase risk during depressive episodes in this follow-up data made us start thinking that there may be different paths to suicidal behavior. Perhaps for some individuals, what happens is that the driver really is, is, the, is the depressive episode and you know, the psychic pain that goes along with depressive episode and that pushes the suicidal ideation, or propels the suicidal ideation. And perhaps for other individuals, it was completely different. And if you've read uh, psychological autopsy histories, you know that for some individuals, they seem to be doing fine. Something happens, and they're off to the races oftentimes with very little warning. So as we thought about that, we started looking for explanations in our data. And of course, the idea that there's subtypes of suicidal behavior is not at all new. People have been talking about suicidal behavior as being 
either violent or nonviolent, right? So the difference between gunshot wounds and jumping, for example, as opposed to an overdose. Those are very different kinds of behaviors. Or high lethality, high medical consequences versus low medical consequences, right? The person who takes an overdose of 10 Valium and goes to sleep and nothing really happens, even though they intended to kill themselves, as opposed to the person who does something quite lethal. And also the concept of patients who have quite planned behaviors, as opposed to the individuals who really don't have a highly developed plan and just act impulsively. So this concept that there were subtypes is a very long-standing one. So we started looking at our data and came up with this uh, idea that there might be two different pathways. And I'm not saying that there are only two different pathways, and not even that the two different pathways can't cross over and that they can't co coexist in one individual. But basically, what we were thinking about was that there's one type of suicidal behavior where people with childhood adversity, people who've been exposed to trauma as, as uh, youngsters, develop a series of characteristics, both psychological, <coughs> clinical, and biological. So they, they have much more trouble with emotional control. Uh, they have much more reactive aggression. And they also have a lot more HPA hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis reactivity. And that those individuals, in the context of a life event, have a spike in their suicidal ideation and act impulsively on those ideas. In contrast, in the bottom panel, we looked at individuals who seem to have, as, as the statistician puts it, they're super normals because they have really good cognitive control on neuropsychological testing. They are not at all aggressive. And however, you do see that they have this low serotonergic tone that we've uh, talked about. And I'll, I'll say more about that in, in, in a bit. But it's in the context of a depressive episode that th these are the individuals who develop kind of persistent suicidal ideation. Like they're struggling with it on an ongoing basis. They think about it. They plan. and in what seems to be out of the blue, act on it. They can't tolerate the psychic pain anymore, and boom, they make a suicide attempt or they die by suicide. So let me show you some of the pilot data we, we are currently collecting. Uh, we're in the second year of this uh, uh, grant to uh, try to show this in a prospective fashion. But let, let, I'm going to just review with you some of the um, preliminary data that we have that suggested these ideas to us. So we looked at the relationship between childhood trauma and aggression. And um, we've actually also published this together with uh, David Brent's team at the University of Pittsburgh. In mood disorders, if you see childhood trauma, that leads to later aggressive behavior. And in borderline personality disorder, uh, most of whom had mood disorders, you see the same thing. That the exposure to trauma early on is a um, harbinger of aggressive behavior later. And we see this in families as well, uh, in studies that we've done of the offspring of individuals with mood disorders with and without suicidal behavior. Again, this very close relationship between childhood abuse and later aggressive behavior. And interestingly, uh, when, what we saw is that the individuals who had, in the, in the sample, this is Barbara Stanley's sample uh, of borderline patients with uh, mood disorder, that the individuals who had uh, childhood trauma showed a lot of variability in their suicidal ideation using ecological momentary assessment. And that they would develop suicidal ideation in the context of things like disagreements or feeling rejected. So things that are not the usual catastrophic things that we think about, you know, financial ruin, trouble with the law, that things that are relatively minor uh, lead to these uh, spikes. And here are some uh, examples of, I don't know how well you can see them, but here on, on the upper uh, two plates, 
what you're looking at is the suicidal ideation documented over a seven-day period using ecological momentary assessment. And this is a method which many of you are familiar with in which we actually send prompts to individuals during six different strata of the day at random times and ask them about stressors, suicidal ideation. We ask them also about uh, mood and other things. But what you can see here is that for the high aggression, highly aggressive, highly impulsive individuals, their suicidal ideation is all over the place. And it seems to go very high up and then return to a relatively low level pretty quickly. In contrast, for those individuals who have low aggression impulsivity, they may have low suicidal ideation, like the person in, on, on your left in the bottom panel, or they may have sustained more elevated suicidal ideation. And this seemed to make a lot of sense in terms of trying to understand, OK, these are individuals who have very different types of suicidal ideation and probably very different risk profiles. Interestingly, in that same cohort, Barbara Stanley did this really interesting study in which she uh, worked with uh, Kevin Oxner to look at how patients with borderline personality disorder who were suicide attempters managed distancing themselves from affectively charged pictures. And what she found is that the individuals who were suicide attempters didn't bring online the same areas. So they were much less likely to bring online orbital frontal, pre, um, orbital frontal cortex and precuneus, which are related to perspective taking and uh, decision making about uh, risk. And that those individuals who had made suicidal attempts seemed to be much less able to harness the pertinent brain regions needed to actually be able to regulate their emotional responses to things in the environment. We also did uh, very interesting um, studies. This is the Trier, also Barbara Stanley's uh, data. This is a Trier social stress test. And uh, you may be familiar with it. It's a stress test that's meant to test the responsivity of the HPA axis to a psychosocial stressor. So what we do is we have three uh, individuals who look serious wearing a white coat. And the participant is to do some mathematical calculations, arithmetic calculations, and also to give an autobiographical sketch as if they were in an interview. And while they're doing that, we measure their salivary cortisol to see what kind of a cortisol response they mount to this psychosocial stressor. And here again, what we found in purple is that the high aggressive, high impulsive individuals were mounting a much more robust cortisol response to the psychosocial stress. And that was in contrast to the people who were low aggression, or low impulsive or healthy volunteers. So it seems that these individuals have not only a revved HPA axis, but also in the context of these stressors are developing these spikes in suicidal ideation. And interestingly, if in looking at these individuals with um, brief suicidal ideation, right, which is uh, linked to the uh, cortisol, you could also look at using a different kind of measure. This is from one of the items in the um, scale for suicidal ideation uh, that Beck has. So this is not using ecological momentary as assessment, but using a much cruder type of measure, you still can see that the brief ideators have a much more robust, and this is different, this is a depressed uh, uh, cohort, um, that, that even using that more crude measure, you can still see the difference in the cortisol response that is mounted by the individuals who report that their suicidal ideation is more on the fleeting side than on the persistent side. So that was the basis on which we built the first panel uh, on the top there, describing these more impulsive, 
stress responsive types of individuals. And we think of these individuals as having, again, childhood abuse that leads them to have poor emotional control, poor cog uh, cognitive control of their emotions, uh, more reactive aggression, HPA react axis reactivity, and that constellation sets them up for a response with suicidal ideation in the context of a stressor. Now the other type of uh, individual which I described, as, as I said, the individuals with good cognitive control, with low reactive aggression, and with this poor serotonergic term, tone really appear to be very different. And, and I'll show you some of the data. So one of the things that we know, of course, is that if you look at um, attempters compared to non-attempters, as a group, the attempters are more aggressive. And we've known that for a very, very long time. But if you look at the low aggression attempters, what you find is that they have fewer past attempts, they're less impulsive and less hostile, and they're less likely to report childhood trauma. Again, suggesting that these, this is a different cohort of individuals who are suicidal. And when we looked at the follow-up data, follow, following up these low aggression suicide attempters, what we found is that their suicide attempts during the follow-up period, they were just as frequent but they were much more lethal, twice as lethal. Uh, lethality of six means that you have to be hospitalized for the medical consequences of your suicide attempt. So it's a very different type of phenotype. The other thing is that they had much higher scores of depression, uh, going along with this idea that it's the psychic pain generated by the depression that drives the, this more continuous um, suicidal thinking. And interestingly, they also had less, fewer life events than the high aggression people, and that's not too surprising, right? If you're very aggressive, you're likely to precipitate a lot of bad things happening in, to you and your environment. So um, this panel is illegible to you, I know, but let me just uh, say that um, this was a uh, study that, that uh, we published in 2014 where we looked at 100 individuals who had uh, serotonin 1A receptor PET scanning to um, look at their, the relationship between uh, 1A binding and um, suicidal ideation as well as the lethality of suicide attempts. And what we found is that the individuals who had higher binding in terminal fields, which we interpret to be an upregulation due to low serotonergic tone, that those individuals had higher lethality scores on their suicide attempts, and also that they were much more likely to have um, the type of suicidal ideation that is more persistent. Again, going along with this concept that you know, it's the uh, deep depression, psychic pain, driving a more continuous and persistent suicidal ideation, which naturally will be related to better planning of the suicidal behavior and therefore more lethal outcomes. And in fact, when we, also, when we look at things like cognitive control, we looked at Stroop interference. So the Stroop test, as you know, is a test in which we show the participant a word for a color, so the word blue in red font. And they're supposed to read the word and ignore the color of the font. The interference effect is the, the increased time that it takes them to, figure, to, to actually answer accurately. So these patients with this type of profile with high serotonin 1A binding, with less aggressive behavior, those individuals actually have super normal Stroop interference. They do better than our healthy volunteers. So these are people with really, really good cognitive control. And I, I don't have the data here. No, actually, that's not true. And the bottom, is, the bottom panels are um, for the continuous performance task, another uh, measure of cognitive control. So these are individuals, this is why the uh, statisticians say like, oh, these are super normals, how can they be suicide attempters? But I think it really explains uh, perhaps some of those individuals that I was talking about before, that 
that appears not to have a psychiatric condition. And I say that because I believe that um, when, when uh, I was telling you about that uh, intern who was seen as the picture of mental health, a really positive person, that person, if I had to guess, was probably depressed. But he had enough emotional and intellectual reserves that nobody could tell. And my guess is that those are the kind, right? You can imagine that that guy might have been like this. Super duper cognitive control, really low aggression, really very good cognitive functioning. But still, the psychic suffering is there. So we also looked at the serotonin 1A receptor uh, prospectively to see its ability to predict the lethality of suicidal behavior and found the same thing. And this we published in 2016. We found that if people had greater 5-HT1A binding in terminal fields and cortical fields, that they had much greater planning for suicidal behavior and much greater lethality, which of course makes sense. So I hope that I've made a reasonable case that there are at least two subtypes of suicidal behavior. I think those of you who study um, neurobiology know that uh, the serotonin system and the HPA axis are not exactly independent. In fact, there's a tremendous amount of crosstalk between these two systems. And yet, at the same time, we know that these are the two most commonly implicated systems in suicidal behavior. And so this starts to get us, I think, to a conceptualization of suicidal behavior that might be a little bit more um, fine-grained, that might help us under, un uncover different profiles of risk that might ultimately yield some biosignatures. And this is probably only two of probably, we're guessing that there are probably three or four subtypes. And that's based on data analyses that we have done, but also others have done, looking at uh, large groups of participants and doing latent class analysis to identify subgroups in the, in the um, sample in terms of suicide risk. And most groups that have looked at this have found anywhere between five and six groups, with one of the groups being very low risk for suicide, and then four to five different gradations of suicide risk. So there probably are more subtypes. And we still, as I mentioned at the beginning, don't know whether this is a characteristic of the individual or if it's a state. And those are all questions that we still have to uh, elaborate, assuming, of course, that the data cooperate with us. So I just wanted to thank you for your interest and for your attention. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. <laughs> Ross. So we have not looked at that specifically. The model would suggest that it does not. But it's an empiric question that we need to look at. Thank you for asking that. Diego. Great talk. Uh, great talk, Maria. A uh, wonderful uh, summary. I noticed with your cortisol data, as we also often also see in our own data sets, that you might have actually two groups of patients, right? Actually, one showing hyper responsiveness in the trier, and actually others that, that show blunted response yes. that were actually below the control subject. So could you maybe comment on, on that in terms of uh, the, the relevance of this uh, potential pattern, hyper versus hyper responsiveness vis-a-vis yes, uh, yes. Vis -vis suicide? Thank you for raising that. So it is true that, in fact, in many studies of suicide attempters, and we have found this too, if you look at baseline cortisol, the cortisol uh, levels tend to be depressed. And there are some individuals who seem to have blunted, who are suicide attempters or who are depressed, who seem to have blunted responsivity to, um, to cortisol. I think that it speaks to this notion. It depends on the composition of the sample, right? And I think that um, we have sometimes been able to see that signal. And other times, as the group, uh, as the sample size grows, sometimes the signal goes away, suggesting that there's, there's heterogeneity that's probably dampening the signal. 
Yeah, uh, in, hi. Hi. In, in the work of Fawcett, who identified the, uh, you know, the psychobiology of depression study, he segregated acute from chronic risk factors, and uh, the uh, suicidal ideation was in the chronic risk factors. Yes. Are your findings uh, reversing that, or should it alert clinicians to the more significant role of suicidal ideation? So suicidal ideation as a predictor has been very unsatisfying. And I think it's because, uh, as Dr. Fawcett very well delineated, there are just too many intervening variables that affect risk. And we know that there are some individuals who have quite pronounced suicidal ideation but have very strong elements that protect them. So for example, they may be very religious or they may feel that their responsibility to their family doesn't allow them to act on their suicidal thoughts. So I think that that's one of the hindrances for suicidal ideation as a predictor. But I think also the fact that there are these different patterns that had not previously, you know, we didn't have the methodology to be able to really identify this variability before. That uh, the variability in the pattern, I think, also means that we have very differing risks. I would suggest that these individuals with very variable uh, suicidal ideation are probably at higher risk when they become suicidal to do it in part because they're more aggressive and impulsive. Thank you. Have you had a chance to look at uh, this in the college age uh, population or younger age? It wasn't clear to me from the data what, where the age distribution is in this. Wondered if you have thoughts about that. So that's a really interesting question that goes to the point that as the individual matures, they typically become less impulsive and less aggressive, right? So you would predict that in an adolescent group, you should be able to see a preponderance, if you will, of the more stress-reactive type of suicidal ideation. We have not yet looked at that, but we do have data that might be able to address that in our family studies of offspring. That's a really important point. Thank you for raising it. So I am mindful of the time. It's 1 o'clock. This clock is a little slow. So um, it's 1 o'clock. So I want to wrap up our Q&A for now. And let's just have a round of applause for Dr. Akendo.